Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes, and we've been reporting on a lot of the happenings on as far as the digital uh, streaming market goes, you know, Disney+, Plus, uh, Hulu, HBO Max, and all that. And we got a lot of news to talk about today as far as those uh, streaming uh, platforms. And today, to talk with me about this is my good friend, Nalo. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Wes. Thanks for having me back on the channel. Well, I'm glad you could make it. And the first piece of big news that happened is cord cutting is at an all-time high. As far as the first quarter of 2020, the pay TV sector cable saw the biggest losses that they've ever seen in the history as far as a decrease in uh, subscribers down over 7% down to numbers that were like uh, 1995 like. Isn't that insane? Yeah, that's crazy. And I think we're really finally seeing the pendulum swing where your pay-per-view kind of mindset, maybe even now, like my parents who are older generation are asking how they can get onto Netflix because they just know that, you know, there's so many more options, no commercials. And I think it's starting to creep up on the older generations and uh, people now who already are into streaming have more and more options. So, you know, this expensive cable bill is looking less attractive every month. Well, and of course, if you think about it right now, there's no live sports. Really the only thing that cable has to offer are news channels really otherwise you can get all the same content or even better content via streaming youtube there are so many different platforms to get information from and really if you don't want really biased news which is basically what all the news networks uh you know in as far as north america goes they all they all have a slant if you want more unbiased stuff you would kind of have to go to youtube anyway yeah, I mean, the information age is upon us. And like we've been saying, the kind of market developments are going to be accelerated uh, through this kind of turbulent time. And we're seeing uh, just more and more streaming wars, streaming news uh, heating up. And you don't really hear anything about a new primetime TV show or some sort of Super Bowl-esque event that's going to really want people to you know, keep onto their cable boxes. Yeah, we're definitely coming through to a new time. And we knew that COVID-19, coronavirus, we're, we're going to have some victims, and it feels like one of the bigger victims in the entertainment is going to end up being cable providers or even um, satellite providers. It doesn't. Uh, they might not uh, be long for this world as people start moving over to these streaming platforms. Of course, a lot of these uh, companies that provide uh, shows for cable are already trying to create their own platforms, and we have th- uh, talked about how we think there's going to be uh, maybe a little bit too much content and, and there are going to be some mergers or or things like that. But one company that is doing great is Disney Plus over at Disney. As far as their subscriptions, they're, they're almost double what they uh, predicted that they would be by the end of 2020. They're over 50 million. And we're seeing now projections are saying that Disney could break 200 million subscribers by 2025. By that time, I think they were predicting that they would be just over 50, that is absolutely a bonkers. They're going to go four times what they the analysts predicted to begin with. Do you think that they can hit 200 million subscribers by 2025? I think it's certainly possible that they can hit it, but I'll take a bit of a contrarian take here in that Disney itself is not doing that great right now, while they are getting more and more subscribers for Disney+. Plus. So Disney as a whole, one of the only positive news that they have going for them right now to get their stocks going up is more positive momentum behind Disney+. Plus. So even if they can hit this target or not, it kind of seems well-timed when Disney doesn't have much other news to say, well, Disney Plus is going to be bigger and better than we ever projected. On the other hand, it's probably true because we're seeing the cord cutting. We're seeing more people locked down, more people signing up for streaming services. So I think it's a balance. Um, They might be overreaching with their numbers, but it definitely makes sense to say their projections should be bumped up given how people are reacting to the new times. Well, yeah, we're having accelerated evolution in the market 200 million seems like a lot. Netflix, which has, of course, been on the market for over a decade now, they haven't even hit that number. I believe they're right at just over 180 million subscribers. So to be able to, to go, get that number you know, in five short years, that would be a huge achievement. Of course, I don't think, me personally, I'm a bit more uh, skeptical about this because I think it's going to end up biting them that they don't have a lot of new uh, programming and new material for, for – um, new subscribers to maintain their interest once quarantine is over and people's lives start getting back to normal. Whereas you look at Netflix, constant new programming, you look at HBO Max, a lot of, a big slate of new program, programming coming up and there's going to be some competition for those eyeballs moving forward because not everyone's going to be able to afford every streaming platform. 
Yeah, absolutely. And well, we're going to talk about this uh, in another video, but <clears throat> you know, the actual production of this content is much more complicated than you may think when it comes to things like safety and insurance and how that is all going to change now. So this kind of dearth of content Disney Plus has put themselves in may last even longer than we think, and this might entice them to kind of you know, stream push over a few more uh, production films uh, that were going to be released for theaters, maybe on Disney Plus, just to try to get people going. We saw they already announced a documentary of the making of The Mandalorian because they didn't really have much content going. So maybe they'll hit those numbers by 2025, but maybe that real growth won't start until 2022. Mm -hmm. Well, that's definitely the one thing that they do have going for them is the new program, the new content they are creating. They are big, uh, you know, uh, franchises that people recognize from the big screen. So they're translating Star Wars down here, down to Disney Plus, which has been much more successful. People like The Mandalorian, whereas a lot of the movies have been this, uh, divisive. We know we have an Obi Wan uh, uh, streaming show coming up. The second season of the Mandalorian sounds like we have another uh, female-led Star Wars show coming up as well. But a lot of those MCU titles as well, moving those characters, and they're keeping the stars from the movies in the uh the actual disney plus production so we're getting uh captain america or i'm sorry winter soldier uh falcon we're getting wandavision and we're gonna actually have the the stars of the tv or the movies coming down to the the streaming platforms and i do think that will translate well when they can get those productions up and that the actual shows on the, the platform yeah i think they'll definitely do well given just how many people are you know clamoring fans for the MCU, even people who don't necessarily like you know, comic books or something. But with such a long gap of time, too, we just have to see if there's kind of fan fatigue of the MCU uh, could be. But, you know, it seems like they still have this kind of huge momentum, big events when they're announcing these uh, shows. And once they finally get released, probably not till next year, um, you know, Disney Plus will start to build up this nice arsenal of original content. Like you said, the bad thing is they had to shut all the productions down. They're taking massive losses. We know that they've acquired at least $11 billion in new credit and debt that they can go and use. But we don't know exactly when the parks are going to open. They're still incur incurring losses. And to start the productions up is going to cost money. There's likely people that have moved on that they didn't, they couldn't just wait for the production to start up. They had to go take new jobs and things like that. So it's not like they just get a start where they uh, start up where they stop. So there, there's definitely a, a lot of moving parts to actually getting these shows onto the platform. And who knows, maybe a Few of them won't actually even make it. We actually have some pretty bad news confirmed for Disney Plus. Kevin Mayer, who was basically the uh, the architect of Disney Plus, who was in charge of Disney's like uh, streaming platform and things like that, he has taken a new job. I guess he was passed over for the CEO position at Disney for Bob Chap Chapik, who does the parks uh, for for Disney, and he has moved on to be the CEO of TikTok, the the Chinese. Um, you know, social media platform. Kind of crazy. Yeah, I think this is actually really interesting news, uh, probably because this um, guy was so involved with kind of Disney Plus and streaming and in a leadership position and he wasn't selected. He, you know, signaled he was in for the long haul at Disney. But uh, on the other hand, this isn't streaming, but we've just seen an explosion in TikTok becoming one of the most popular applications out there today. But not only that, it has an influence of how people consume media. And we have a whole new generation of filmmakers with very quick editing tools to do these kind of slow motions or special effects. And you know, TikTok is really short content. So it's curious, is um, you know, TikTok going to be Disney-fied? Are we going to try and start to see like microbursts of content on there actually professionally produced? Is he going to bring some of this kind of experience from Disney over into TikTok? And something I don't think we've covered on the channel, there's actually, I don't know how to pronounce it, it was called Queeby. It was um, this other streaming service meant to challenge Netflix. It raised something like $300 million, and they have these micro episodes as well, and so far it's failing completely. Uh, they're blaming it on coronavirus, but I think uh, you know that model might not have really been figured out. It's another one of these classic, you know, they raised hundreds of millions without ever making money. Um, so we will maybe see if TikTok, with the help of this ex-Disney executive, tries to move into actually short bursts of content. Um, you know, episodes that trickle out and are only a few minutes long, and maybe that will start to take eyeballs away from the traditional streaming as we're getting this market acceleration happening. That's crazy. It almost feels like that would be more of a competitor for YouTube than actual like a streaming platform with with scripted television shows. But you know, definitely uh, short bursts, uh, comedic episodes, content where people are basically reacting things of that nature would be definitely more interesting. 
Yeah, so eyes are on how TikTok, if it's going to become Disney-fied and, you know, maybe emerge a new form of entertainment as well. Well, it also tells you kind of like at least pre-COVID where Disney's, uh, you know, eye was on or what maybe they thought was more important as they took the guy that was kind of the architect of all their parks, moved him into the CEO position rather than uh, taking the guy that was basically creating that new streaming platform that we knew that they thought was really important, but you could tell that they still were prioritizing parks. I think if they went back in time, they might might wish they had made a different decision seeing the boom that they're seeing in Disney Plus and how important it is for them and how it was more, uh, we'll call it weather resistant to some of these things. You know, I don't think this is going to be the last pandemic, whereas their cruise lines, uh, obviously their theme parks, their their movie industry stuff uh, is all very vulnerable to these kind of uh, worldwide shutdowns. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. And uh, if Bob Iger was stepping down now, I'm sure that they would be really prioritizing Disney Plus and you know promoting the guy who is in charge of that. So, yeah, uh, an unfortunate loss for Disney, but it kind of adding a new spin to the video content domain, and we'll see how it develops. So there's a, a little bit more news, a couple of things we need to talk about before we wrap this, uh, you know, kind of a streaming type of uh, news segment here. Apple, apparently we had talked about this before. They had, I think it's $200 billion in cash. We talked about if they wanted to be major players in the streaming category, obviously they have Apple TV. They had enough cash on hand to really outbid any other company for anything that they wanted to. And it looks like they're starting to, to make their move. And they're putting some money down on older TV shows and films to boost up their Apple TV uh, catalog of materials that are available for people to go in and, and get some eyes on their new products. Yeah, so this is something we kind of talked about and was predicting um, a few weeks back. And this is still kind of just in industry inside info hearsay, but it is being reported in news sources like Bloomberg. They haven't named the actual names of the studios or the shows, but it does show that you know Apple is taking its TV streaming service seriously. They're not necessarily in a rush to turn a profit because one, they are profitable, and two, they have an enormous stockpile of cash. And it would take less than even 0.1% of that 200 billion to start to buy an old TV show or licenses to movies that were unreleased. And so I think it's kind of the silent actor here is big tech and Apple, um, maybe also Amazon. Uh, as we heard rumors that they might actually purchase a movie theater, that these kind of silent big tech actors that are less affected by COVID and have a huge amounts of cash are going to start you know, becoming players in the entertainment industry. Well, we know with streaming, nostalgia and a lot of these older shows be, are a big part in being, bringing people in to go in and binge content. Uh, you know, Friends was a huge part of Netflix. Obviously, The Office is, is was a huge part of Netflix. Obviously... <laughs> Uh, I, I believe the Big Bang Theory is still a big draw for Netflix, and people are they're paying top dollar for these uh, properties to bring them onto their platforms exclusively. So if if Apple TV can go and find one of those nostalgic hits, like you think about maybe a Cheers, maybe Seinfeld isn't. Uh, I know that one's on Netflix, or I, believe, I think that one's actually on Amazon Prime. Uh, but if they could go and get some of these, uh, you know, good long-running shows that have a big fervent audience that still want that material and get that on there and be the exclusive home for some of those really cool older shows. It definitely uh, is has been proven to bring in subscribers. Yeah, so keep your eye out for Apple. Uh, they have some high quality shows out already. And I think that, you know, they're not in a rush. They have tons of capital and they're taking it seriously. And then the last one we have to talk about is HBO Max, one of the newest players in the streaming realm. Uh, although it does have a hefty price tag, it does have a great catalog of content. Of course, it has all the, the HBO movies, all the HBO uh, TV shows in the past, and a lot of uh, new content coming up that people recognize, Looney Tunes, a lot of DC stuff. Uh, I know there's a Kaylee Cuoco uh, a TV show as well. So they got a lot of things moving and shaking that they're planning out. They've just released their uh, schedule, I believe, for their second wave of new programming. And then today we learned, uh, well, maybe not today, uh, yesterday we learned that the Snyder Cut is going to be exclusive to HBO Max, and I think they're they're pumping in like twenty million dollars just to get that thing ready. Uh, that's a big commitment. Yeah, that's a big commitment, and uh, it's probably a topic for another video of how you know this kind of barrage of fans could uh, you know influence the studio's direction. But it's also the case of well, they already have all this raw footage; they just need to do the CGI. Twenty million is definitely a lot, but it's a fraction of what they would have to spend on a movie from scratch. So could be a combination of you know listening to this 
group of fans while also seeing what they could potentially salvage to, you know, and I'm hearing it could even be a episodic over many hours. So they have this raw content. It makes sense that they would want to potentially try to reutilize it. But I can say it does definitely feeling the presence of HBO Max now on the internet. I'm starting to get ads on YouTube and across different banners. Um, so they're definitely starting to push out the promotion for HBO Max and, you know, making people aware. And unlike Disney Plus, they actually have multiple waves of content already. They have the whole backlog of HBO, which, you know, people are going to want to watch Sopranos or The Wire or Game of Thrones. But as soon as June and July, they're already coming out with whole new uh, original content. So they're actually really prepared. As they're marketing, they have a lot more to market. They can probably get a lot more people's eyeballs as opposed to Disney can only really, I'm getting ads for Disney Plus. All I see is the Mandalorian, Mandalorian. Here, you know, they can mm -hmm. target a whole different group of people, uh, you know, women, children, uh, old men, depending on which content they want to target. So it's good to see that they're actually, you know, ready to join this battle. All right. So do you think other streaming platforms, let's say that this is a success and the Snyder Cut brings in a, a slew of new subscribers that people are going to be, you know, maybe some of these streaming platforms are going to want to have the the the, uh, the the feed cut of Ghostbusters or maybe some of these uh, director's cuts of that we knew that the material was was out there, but we never got to see the director's vision and those being like uh, big draws for people to come on a, a, some of these streaming platforms? Uh, I can't say if it will necessarily translate to subscribers, but I can say this is something that fans already, you know, want and there's a history of it, uh, but before pre-Twitter. So for example, one of the most classic and amazing sci-fi movies is Blade Runner, but it was famously the theatrical version was apparently completely cut differently than the director Ridley Scott's vision. And so uh, eventually, I think the director's cut got released. It has its own cult following. I think there are about six versions of that movie you can watch. There uh, are multiple versions. <laughs> yeah. So there's already kind of a history of fans, you know, picking uh, which cut they like the most. And if it, you know, only takes a small amount of budget compared to making a new movie to kind of recut the movie, you know, if they need content, they can't do production, uh, you might as well. I already saw some uh, that the Ghostbusters, the one that came out in 2016, the director was hinting that he has over three hours of content ready for his director's mm -hmm. cut. Not the one that I would be interested in, but we are already starting to see some people, you know, poke their heads up and say, hey, I can do a director's cut too. You know, what's crazy is we have like a, almost a 180 version of that. Right now on Disney Plus, you've got all the, the Star Wars, the original trilogy. You have the edited versions that George Lucas created and re-released in the theaters. And people want the original versions without his changes. <laughs> but I think contractually, Disney can't actually release them. But it, I guarantee you it would bring people in. People would subscribe to Disney Plus if they could show the original unedited versions of the original trilogy. I know I have those on some old VHS before the uh, <laughs> edits came out. But yeah, mm -hmm. you cannot get those on Blu-ray. You cannot rent them for whatever reason that's the case. So it's both, both goes both ways. The point is, you know, is kind of content that already exists, but being chopped up and edited differently or being restored. Is that a new strategy streaming services can use to attract people? And it just may be. I think it is. All right, now that'll basically wrap up our, our coverage today of, of some of the stuff going on in the streaming world. Cord cutting is an all time high. The streaming uh, you know, wars are, are heating up. I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, thanks, Wes. Take care. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I would appreciate it very much. It helps us attract more views for the channel. Subscribe for future commentary, comic book news, and reviews. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications. If you want to talk comics, movies, and much, much more, you can follow me on Twitter, at Wes underscore from underscore TC. With that, Salamat Po, and I'm out.